Over the last six weeks, the highest numbers of new COVID-19 cases have come from rural America. But a path beyond the pandemic is finally coming into focus as we turn the calendar to December. And a number of hopeful vaccines make a final thrust toward the finish line. Good evening and welcome to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. We know that you have questions about COVID-19 that are unique to rural America. So tonight you can get answers straight from the experts who have been at the forefront of the crisis. 877 731-6733. I'm going to give you that number one more time. 877-731-6733. Any question you have about COVID-19 is up for grabs. Our doctors are here to help you, and we know this is unique in rural America. 877-731-6733. Our phone lines are open now. Joining us tonight from the University of Nebraska Omaha, world-renowned Dr. Jeffrey Gold, the Chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center. We also welcome Pathology and Microbiology Department Chairman Dr. Steve Henricks. Thank you so much for joining us. Dr. Gold, let's get right to the numbers. How widespread is COVID-19 in rural America tonight? So, Christina, unfortunately, the numbers are not good, uh, particularly after the holiday weekend. Uh, we are up to about 13.4 million confirmed cases, as our first graphic shows, adding over 136,000 uh, yesterday alone. That means in less than a week, we added over a million confirmed cases across our nation. 266,000 plus deaths. And again, we've been averaging over 1,500 deaths uh, a day for the last several weeks. And to put that into reality, Christina, that would mean that there's one American dying every minute, 24 hours a day, seven days a week for the last month. Oh. And even more tragically than that, over 90,000 people were hospitalized across our nation as of midnight last night, uh, which is 36 percent higher than it was over the last 14-day period. And as the map of our nation shows, uh, there is continued substantial spread widely across rural America. Our farming and ranching communities uh, are rarely, rarely, if ever, uh, are they known for having no cases and many of them have their critical access hospitals uh, and their local community hospitals filled with patients. In the state of Nebraska, over 50% of every intensive care unit patient in the entire state currently uh, is a COVID-19 patient. When we look at some of these run charts, as our next graphic shows, uh, what we'll see is that there's a third peak uh, associated with leading up to Thanksgiving and a slight drop off immediately after Thanksgiving. Now, it may be that things are getting better and that all of the precautions, the non-pharmacologic interventions that have been so important are finally working, or it may just be that testing and case reporting over the Thanksgiving holidays have actually fallen off, and hopefully we'll have a chance to unpack that in a few minutes. But even if we look at this next graphic over the same period of time, it shows us the fatalities, it shows us the deaths, and the Thanksgiving holidays were a time to look across the table, even virtually, and see whose relatives are no longer there. And given the fact we've lost over a quarter of a million Americans, that is a startling number uh, to consider. And when we do this and look at these numbers state by state, it just continues to underscore how big a challenge this is in rural America. You look at the top states, so, for instance, as of yesterday, the average across the United States was 44 uh, new cases diagnosed per 100,000. So North Dakota is over twice that number. South Dakota, Minnesota, Wyoming, New Mexico, uh, even my state of Nebraska, well over twice the U.S. average. And tragically, as this next slide shows us, it's not just the number of cases, but it's actually the number of deaths per 100,000 as well. So while the U.S. number uh, is averaging a little over one death per 100,000 uh, across the country, South Dakota is two, North Dakota 1.5. Again, considerably high levels of mortality uh, across rural America relating to 
all things of comorbidity, aging populations, lifestyle, work ethic, all of those sort of things go into raising the risk uh, in our rural communities. It's so hard to see those numbers, but when you think about those numbers as, as human beings, as lives, you know, so many family members wish for just five more minutes, just five more minutes with someone sometimes, and it's really hard to see that, especially around the holidays, which is why we're happy to get some good news tonight. Dr. Henricks, there is some good news about coronavirus vaccines. At least three of the experimental vaccines show remarkable efficacy. Can you give us an update? Absolutely. There now look like at least three vaccines that are very close to market. Uh, we should be hearing now in the next couple of days uh, when they will be released. And uh, there's a lot of good data behind them indicating that they will be uh, very uh, effective and useful for our population. Okay, well, we have so many questions tonight, many regarding vaccines. Let's get right to it. First up is Oliver of Kansas. He says, since farmers have been essential workers all year, will we get the vaccine early? And who do we contact to get the shot? So, Oliver, you may know that the, uh, our Centers for Disease Control, <clears throat> members of the Food and Drug Administration, uh, other branches of Health and Human Services, our federal department, uh, are going to be meeting actually tomorrow, Tuesday, to specifically look at the prioritization. And what I'm hearing and what has been recommended by the National Academy of Medicine is simply that the first round, which is probably going to be the Pfizer one, because that was the first to have an emergency use authorization application, that's the one that has to be stored at very, very, very cold temperatures, is going to go to frontline health care workers, <coughs> excuse me, and hopefully uh, we can protect those uh, from uh, the ravages of infection so that they can care for those that are most uh, affected. The second would probably be the Moderna product, then the AstraZeneca product, and then there are going to be several others as well, all of which have very high efficacy rates, the highest, of course, uh, being the Pfizer and the Moderna which are both uh, mRNA uh, vaccines. But after the frontline healthcare workers are immunized, uh, it is very likely that the ch change is gonna go to those that are most vulnerable, those that are older, uh, those that are in long-term care facilities, uh, those that have comorbidities, such as diabetes, high blood pressure, those that are being treated for cancer uh, of all age groups, uh, to try to really reduce the risk of transmission in those that are most likely to get hospitalized and those tragically that are most likely to pass away from COVID-19. Okay, thank you for that question. Next up, we're going to Indiana to speak with Larry. Thanks for joining the conversation, Larry. Go right ahead. Thank you. Uh, the question I have concerns the vaccine. My wife and I are both in our middle 70s, so we've been patiently waiting for the vaccine. The concern that I have is she has drug allergies, uh, in particular penicillin, sulfa, Keflex, and Darvon. And I'm wondering if uh, there was anything in the research that would keep her from taking the vaccine, or would she be able to take the vaccine with these allergies? Larry, great question, of course. And uh, my advice always uh, is to start off by having a conversation with her trusted health care advisor, the people that know you and know your wife the best, who understand how severe her allergies are. You know, there are mild allergies, moderately severe allergies. There are life-threatening allergies. But there's nothing about the specifics that you mentioned that would make one or more of the vaccines uh, seem unlikely. But let's turn to Dr. Hendricks, who knows an awful lot about these vaccines. Steve, what do you think? Is there anything that Larry should be concerned about? I would agree with you. Uh, for example, this is not like the influenza vaccine where they're going to ask you, uh, do you have an allergy to eggs? In this situation, uh, none of the indications or the conditions you mentioned are ones that are likely to exclude you from the vaccine. But you may have others that would be of some concern, and that's why it's so important to go back to your local health care professional and ask first. All right. Thank you so much for that call. We appreciate it, Larry. Our next question is from John in Texas. Let's listen. I use a CPAP and oxygen at night. 
And my question is, I also have a SoClean sanitizer for CPAP and a Lumen sanitizer, L-U-M-I-N. And my question is, will the Lumen sanitize face mask? I was told that it would. It uses, a, I guess you call it ultraviolet light. Thank you. Yeah, John, uh, it sounds like uh, there's a lot of reasons uh, to be concerned, and anything that we can do to sanitize these face masks is useful. You know, our institution did a lot of the preliminary work, the research I'm talking about, on the use of ultraviolet light to sanitize N95 respirator masks. And we've known that the high-dose uh, ultraviolet light of specific frequencies will actually kill the virus in a relatively short exposure. So anything that you can do to clean the masks uh, with soap and water, let them dry out completely, and then zap them if you can uh, with uh, ultraviolet uh, light, uh, gives you the highest chance of not just uh, eradicating uh, COVID virus, but of, of all pathogens. And as we know, that masks, respirators, tubing, et cetera, can be the place that viruses, bacteria, and other infectious agents uh, can live and grow. And so all of those precautions are very important to take. So uh, great question and uh, wishing you the best. All right, thank you for that, John. Next is Andrew in North Dakota. He says, how will I know which vaccine is safest for me? I haven't gone to the doctor in years and have to travel two hours away just to see one. Yeah, Andrew, you know, there are going to be multiple different types of vaccine. We actually have a slide that, uh, that shows the four basic groups of vaccines. Uh, and uh, so they vary from those that have live virus components, those that have molecular material, uh, those that have protein-based and then those that are what we call viral vector vaccines, that is to say, a virus that's been engineered so that it can't cause disease. So the best way to know which is for you is going to be determined by uh, the safety precautions that come out when the Food and Drug Administration uh, approves these vaccines. And then when they come out, each of these vaccines is going to carry with them some information regarding the safety and efficacy of the clinical trial. So based upon age, based upon whether you have any, so what we call comorbidities, uh, you know, are you immunosuppressed for any reason? Have you been treated for cancer? Do you have diabetes? Of course, uh, other factors as well in children uh, even, uh, then uh, a determination will have to be made by your local healthcare professional. Very similar to the, what we do for influenza. You know, there are multiple flu vaccines that are made every year. It's not one size fits all, and that depending on your age, your comorbidity, uh, et cetera, uh, the correct vaccine is selected for you to reduce your risk and give you the maximum uh, efficacy. And so depending on what's available uh, when the new vaccines come out. All right. I've got to address the skepticism about vaccines in general, because many of us have heard from somebody who probably wasn't a doctor, who's told them, don't take the vaccine, don't get the vaccine. I mean, what do you say to these skeptics out there? And maybe maybe you can give us some advice for how we can counter that if they say that to us. Sure, well, you know, no matter what the treatment is, medical treatment, vaccines, uh, anything that's new, there are what we refer to as the early adopters, those people that say, I gotta be first in line, let's, let's do this, and then, there are those people that say, me, never. Uh, I would never consider doing that. <clears throat> and then the overwhelming majority of people are somewhere in the middle. And what I would say to them, of course, what I would say to my own family, my children, you know, my wife, uh, parents, etc., is that science has to drive this. Science has to be the decision-making factor here. We need to know the data that goes into these clinical trials for both safety and efficacy. And my guess is that for older individuals, frontline healthcare workers, those people that are coming face to face with this virus every day of their working days, 
those young men and young women who are in school, who want to stay in school, professional athletes who want to compete, uh, they're going to be first in line because they understand the risk-benefit ratio favors them. Let's face it, there's a lot of COVID fatigue out there, a lot of pandemic fatigue, and people are getting tired of being quarantined and isolated and wearing masks and not being able to go to sporting events and church and be with their loved ones. And I'm, you know, I'm, you know solidly in that camp. So I'm interested in knowing when the vaccines are available and what their safety and efficacy parameters are. And then at the end of the day, uh, the science has to, has to rule. And so when your physician or my physician says, you know, doctor, I think it's time for you to get immunized and this is the vaccine I think is right for you, that's when I get to roll my sleeve up. Let me ask you, Dr. Henricks, uh, what would you say to somebody uh, who's skeptical about one of these vaccines? Well, my suspicion is that uh, the people who are the audience of, of this show may know more about vaccines and have seen them in, at work than many other uh, individuals across the country. Uh, I know that uh, we routinely uh, vaccinate swine, uh, sometimes cattle, as well as other animals on the farm, and they do it because they know it works. And I think they actually could speak to the value of vaccines more than most anyone else. That's a great point, Steve. Brilliant point. Maybe they should be our poster people. <laughs> The farmers, I mean, they know they know how to vaccinate and they know how to keep their flocks, their herds healthy. There is something to be said for that great point. All right, next up is Fred from Virginia. Thanks for joining us, Fred. Go right ahead. You're welcome. Thank you. Uh, my question is for the doctor is, if you own medication for heart trouble, would this new vaccine affect it uh, in any kind of way the medication you would take or uh, and also, where could you get this vaccine at your own personal physician's office or where? Yeah, Fred. So certainly people who are on medication for heart disease are at higher risk for having complications from COVID. And so you'll probably be very close to the front of the line in terms of availability or whoever you're responding for in terms of availability of the vaccine. Uh, in terms of whether the vaccine is safe for people with heart disease, <clears throat> hopefully the clinical trials, when the data gets shared, will show that there are young and old, men and women, uh, different races and ethnicity, rural and urban populations that have all been part of these clinical trials demonstrating safety. Now, which one will be best for you will be determined by both what's available and what your local healthcare professionals are, are going to recommend. And in terms of where you're going to get it, I think a lot of that is going to depend upon which vaccine. So for instance, and what I mean by that is the logistics. So there are four basic steps that are critical in vaccine development and, and making a population immune. The first is the, the research uh, that goes into the vaccine. The second is the mass manufacturing. That's underway as we speak. Millions of doses, tens of millions, hundreds of millions of doses of vaccine. The third, not to be underestimated, logistics. Shipment, storage, who's actually going to administer it. All of that's got to be worked out in a way that it gets to you. And then finally, the fourth, which we've just addressed somewhat, is whether people are going to have enough confidence in it to roll up their sleeves and get immunized or whether they're going to be skeptical. The logistics are going to be determined by things like how long the vaccine can be stored, at what temperature, how long can it be at room temperature before it has to be injected, how many doses are going to be necessary. The vaccines we've been hearing about thus far, the AstraZeneca product, the Moderna product, and the Pfizer product, uh, all require two doses, three and four weeks apart. And by the way, don't mix and match. Uh, you really want to be sure that if you get a Pfizer for your first dose, you get a Pfizer vaccine uh, for your last dose uh, as well. And so uh, only time will tell. But as these new vaccines, and that's one of the attractions of the AstraZeneca product uh, and the J&J &J products, uh, is that they don't have the same ultra-cold storage requirements and shipment requirements uh, as the Pfizer and the Moderna products do which make them easier to get into your doctor's office. They make them much more uh, like routinely available flu vaccine.
All right. Thank you so much for that call. We are going to pause for a quick the other side of this break, we want to talk a little bit about the possibility of whether or not we will see this emergency authorization denied, if it's a possibility, or will we see the vaccine first roll out as of the 12th of this month? We're going to pose that question to the doctors right after this quick break. More Rural Health Matters with the University of Nebraska Medical Center right after this. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. I'm Christina Loren. Joining us once again, world-renowned doctor Jeffrey Gold, the chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And tonight we also welcome pathology and microbiology department chairman, Dr. Steve Henricks. Before the break, we were talking about that emergency authorization and if there's a possibility that we will not see it go through for Pfizer. So as of now, the FDA committee is slated to meet on December 10th to discuss Pfizer's request. And then December 12th is the first possible day for coronavirus vaccines to be administered. Dr. Gold, is there a chance that timeline will be off? Well, of course there's a chance because the purpose of the Food and Drug Administration review and the whole emergency use authorization process is to look at the data, to look at the science, the construction of the clinical trial, uh, to look at the safety, to look for untoward side effects, <clears throat> then to uh, also look at the efficacy. How many patients in the control group and how many patients in the treatment group uh, actually got COVID? But I would say based upon the information that's been released thus far, which of course is just a very small fraction of it, I would say it's pretty unlikely uh, that that will be sent back for more data collection. But let's ask the expert here. Dr. Hendricks, what do you think? Well, as you just mentioned, neither you nor I have seen the data. And so that's a key um, determiner of what's going to happen next is exactly what the data shows. But what we've heard and what we've seen reported to this point would indicate to me that there's no reason that they are going to delay it. And I think there's all kinds of reasons why uh, releasing it early and uh, is appropriate. All right. 877-731-6733 is the number to call with your question. Thank you for your patience. Tom in Colorado, you're next. Tom, are you Hi, with Dr. us? Gold. I'm there. Uh, Hello, Tom. As we approach the holiday season, hi. As we approach the holiday season, many of us will be receiving greeting cards and packages from around the country. In your opinion, what are the best safe handling practices upon receipt of these items from, for example, the United States Post Office, UPS, and FedEx? You know, we know that the amount of virus that's transmitted by inanimate objects. Uh, meaning packages, groceries, etc., is relatively low, <clears throat> but it's not zero. The majority of the virus is transmitted from other human beings by coughing, sneezing, singing, speaking, uh, etc. But if you could wait a day or two <clears throat> and then maybe wipe down the outside of that package uh, with a quick uh, cleansing cloth, you know, with a sanitizer on it, uh, you know, why not be extra careful? You know, we just don't know who's handling those things. And right now, we're just trying to get to the end of the tunnel where we know that light is strong and those vaccines are going to be available. And so that would be my best advice to you. All right. Thank you for that call, Tom. We're going to go to Iowa this time. Eugene joins the conversation. Go right ahead, Eugene. <clears throat> yeah, thank you for taking my call. Uh, what about hydrotrox, that new, that new drug that Mr. Trump took, and he's running on a full tank? Why can't we have something like that out here that uh, goes along with the vaccine? Well, we actually do, Eugene. Uh, the uh, emergency use authorization uh, was uh, granted uh, for an Eli Lilly monoclonal antibody product, and that the product that uh, the president received was a Regeneron uh, co a cocktail of monoclonal antibodies, and that is currently being uh, reviewed uh, by the Food and Drug Administration right now and hopefully uh, will be available. So I am very pleased to tell you that the Eli Lilly product <clears throat> has been shipped widely across the United States, and we've actually been administering it in early cases, pre-hospital cases uh, of COVID <clears throat> across the state of Nebraska, 
And I'm sure there's some of it available in Iowa as well, Eugene. Now, hopefully, you and your loved ones won't need it. But the, the secret sauce there is if you're going to get treated with one of these monoclonal antibodies, you need to be treated at the very early stages of the COVID infection, not only before hospitalization is necessary, but before supplemental oxygen is necessary. And that's the key to get treated early on when these monoclonals can wipe out the, uh, the virus particles. All right. Thank you for that call, Eugene. We appreciate it. Our next call comes from the Central Plains. Guy has a question about vaccine storage. Let's listen. I'm a farmer from Anzi, Nebraska, here in central Nebraska, and we uh, routinely use uh, AI on our livestock operation, and we store semen. And I was listening to the doctor here from the University of Nebraska Med Center, and he was talking about the concerns they have with the Pfizer vaccines and the stole cords. And I was just wondering, uh, could it be used, uh, the, the liquid nitrogen that we use in our tanks, could it be used for the vaccine? Uh, it would definitely be cold. Uh, it's very easy to transport. It's cheap. And I was just wondering if that would be a solution uh, for the rural areas that I, I've read about, that they said they couldn't transport it out, and the logistics of, of the uh, well of your freezers. I just was wondering if that would be an alternative that could be possibly uh, evaluated to see if, if it would be done in a cost-effective manner. Guy, that's a great suggestion. I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Henricks in a minute, but I just want the audience to know that specially equipped planes, trucks, uh, trains, etc., have already been equipped with this ultra-cold storage and shipment technology so that when we pull the trigger on deploying this vaccine, we are going to be able to get it out to rural and urban communities. But Dr. Henricks, what do you think? Do you think uh, Guy's suggestion of using some of the ultra-cold storage facilities uh, out in rural America can be useful? Um, absolutely. So um, liquid nitrogen um, generates a temperature that's uh, plenty cold, um, even be, uh, beyond that of dry ice, which is how it's being packed right now. Um, but as you've already said, Dr. Gold, uh, good precautions and plans have been made to make sure that the virus and the, uh, the vaccine can be delivered, not just to the large urban centers, but also to rural America. So we don't anticipate that's a problem. But if a, say, a shipment got delayed, that may be some uh, backup storage that would be appropriate and that'll have to be looked into. All right, thank you so much for that question. Next up is Patricia of California. And she says, my son works at a feedlot and he has had COVID. Does he need to get the vaccine since he already had the virus? Yeah, so probably the answer, Patricia, deals with uh, how long ago your son had it. But then there's no definitive answer to this because the research has to be done on immunizing uh, individuals that we know had COVID and that we know developed antibodies uh, to the COVID. But right now, and I ask this question, of our infectious disease group who are gonna to have to make this decision in the trenches, uh, they're currently saying that it's not a bad idea to immunize people, even if they had COVID several months ago. But I'm gonna guess that that jury is gonna be out for a period of time. Uh, Dr. Hendricks, do you have some thoughts on uh, recommending uh, a vaccine for people that have had COVID? Well, my own thinking is that uh, your son would probably not then be at the top of the list uh, there's going to be so many more people who are going to be at higher risk that we'll want to vaccinate first. And I think then later on in the uh, rollout of this uh, vaccine, that's when the decision will be made as to whether or not people who've been previously infected uh, should be getting it. Um, I, I suspect, again, that it's going to be appropriate precaution to get it. There's no harm. But I don't think they're going to be in, offered it in the first wave of the vaccine. Okay, do you think people will still need to wear a mask after they are inoculated? Well, that's a great question also, uh, Christina. And so certainly for a period of time, because immunity uh, doesn't happen, uh, you know, you don't walk out of the doctor's office uh, with your flu shot and your arm still stinging a little bit and you're immune uh, to influenza, it takes weeks. Uh, to build an antibody response uh, and then, uh, you know, what we call an amnestic cellular response uh, to it as well. So I would say at least for several weeks it's going to be necessary. Certainly it's going to be necessary between the first and second dose of those vaccines that require two doses. 
But thereafter, uh, there's going to be, until we get to the point of herd immunity, I'm going to guess people are going to be uh, wearing masks. And the reason I say that is because even though an individual may not be uh, actively infected and ill, that doesn't mean that you can't carry adequate quantities of the virus to infect others who are not immune. How long that's going to last uh, remains to be seen. There was some preliminary data that was just shared recently with several of these vaccines that are now undergoing emergency use authorization consideration that shows that after the both doses of the vaccine have been administered, the ability to transmit the virus goes down. It doesn't go to zero, but it goes down. And so hopefully mask wearing will go away. But I'm going to guess herd immunity is a good three to six months away. Three to six months away, though, I think we can all handle that after the year we've had, Dr. Gold. So we're happy to hear three to six months. That is fantastic. You know, even with the vaccine coming out and and the first doses being distributed, possibly by mid-December, even with that timeline, it still looks like most of us are going to have to social distance over Christmas and Hanukkah this year. Is that going to be the case, do you think? I do. Yep. I think that we're going to, you know, and unfortunately, uh, you know, the media is full of reports of large gatherings over the Thanksgiving weekend, millions of people passing through airports, uh, buses, trains, a lot of road traffic has gone up. And in spite of all of the CDC recommendations, uh, I'm going to guess that we're going to see consequences of this. And it's not going to occur overnight, but it's going to be anywhere between five and 14 days from now that we're going to start to see some case upticks, which is then going to result in another three to five days in hospitalization and use of ventilators and things of that nature. Unfortunately, we're starting off, you know, nationwide uh, at uh, over 40 cases per 100,000 per day. We're starting off at 1,500 deaths per day on average uh, across our country. And so you add that to the events that may have occurred from Thanksgiving uh, I would agree with Dr. Fauci and Dr. Burks and others who have said December looks like it's going to be a cold, dark, and difficult month. The holidays are going to have to require uh, physical isolation and use of masks and all the precautions. But then hopefully as the vaccines start to become more widely available the beginning of the new year, uh, that'll be the light at the end of the tunnel. And that will be when people can start to begin to get back to uh, what I'm going to call the new normal. Okay. Well, we have a question from Mary of Missouri. She says, our women's church group holds an annual caroling event. We are willing to sing with masks on, but wonder if we should just cancel. Well, I think if you use good quality masks, social distance at least six feet, uh, and take other, you know, the usual sanitizing precautions uh, and, is, and do this outdoors, of course, which I'm guessing is what we're talking about, I would say your risk is low. Uh, it's not zero, and because it's hard to do some of the things, but uh, it is low. Now, I, you know, have no idea what it's like to do caroling with a mask six or eight feet apart, uh, outdoors. It may be so difficult that it may practically be necessary to cancel the event. I don't know, Dr. Hendricks, what do you think the best advice for Mary would be? Well, I'm fortunate to be uh, part of a choir, and in fact, that is our plan, and I think it's totally feasible. Uh, six feet is easily a distance you can hear well across. So, yes, I do think that's going to work and uh, in encourage it because uh, getting out and sharing what you have to uh, sing and say is an important activity over the holidays. Well, I'm glad to hear that you're part of a choir. Are you going to go caroling? Um, well, uh, definitely. See that, Dr. Gold? Something about one of your staff members you didn't even know about until tonight. And I have to ask, are you an alto, soprano? <laughs> <laughs> no, I hope I'm a tenor. <laughs> all right. Well, I, I'm so impressed with all the work that you do, and then you go and you sing in a church choir in your spare time. I love finding out those little tidbits about the doctors that we get to work with. Our next question comes from Dorothy of Florida. She says, we had a slew of out-of-towners come through our rural downtown over Thanksgiving. How long will it take for new cases to be counted 
in our area. Yeah, Dorothy, again, this is not going to happen overnight. Uh, I would say as short as three or four days, but as long as 10 days or maybe even slightly more than that. And so you're going to have to continue to take all of those uh, extra precautions. And then it's going to get really difficult because it's going to, you know, contact tracing and testing is the key to this. So when people start to become symptomatic, if they've been exposed, and, you know, again, quoting Dr. Burks, everybody after the Thanksgiving weekend is going to have to act like they've been exposed to somebody with COVID, which means that if you can work from home, please do so. If you're in school, study from home. Please, you know, attend your church services from home uh, until that three to five to seven to ten day interval is over and you're absolutely sure that you're not going to come down with COVID. And by the way, if there's any question of exposure, please get tested. The tests are very highly reliable. They're very specific. And of course, if you test positive, then you really do need to isolate for the full 10 day period. All right. We are going to pause for a quick break, but we still have time for your call. Give us a call. We will take your question. There's still plenty of time to get you in tonight. Now, on the other side of this break, you probably heard a lot about two dose vaccines. Maybe you're like me wondering why two doses? Why is that necessary? We're going to ask the doctors right after this quick break. More Rural Health Matters with the University of Nebraska Medical Center right after this. Welcome back to Rural Health Matters. Thank you for joining us. Joining us once again, world-renowned Dr. Jeffrey Gold, the Chancellor of the University of Nebraska Medical Center. And tonight we also welcome Pathology and Microbiology Department Chairman, Dr. Steve Henricks. Before the break, we were talking about two-dose vaccines. And for many of us, we're more accustomed to one dose. Why is it that so many of these vaccine choices that we have, at least two or three, are going to come in two doses, Dr. Gold? Well, why don't I start and then we'll turn it over to Dr. Henricks. Well, many of our vaccines do require booster doses to strengthen the response. And so this is certainly not a first. And of course, influenza vaccine gets repeated every year. But why two doses and why four weeks apart? Uh, I'll let Dr. Henricks take a shot at that one. Oh, it's a very interesting question. And, uh, and it relates to us being very complex uh, human beings uh, with biological processes. But I think the best analogy is that uh, any of us uh, learn better if you've had repeated exposure to something. Our B cells and our monocytes respond in the exact same way. The more times they see something, the more acutely they respond to it. So the first time they'll do a little bit of a response, the second time it's much, much better. And the spacing of the time uh, between the doses has the exact same effect. The longer you space out the the um, effort or the, the repeat of the initial instruction, the more you end up remembering it. In the same case, that's the exact same situation with our, our B cells and our memory cells. So is there something magical about four weeks, Steve, that, uh, that people gravitate to, or that just happens to be a practical n number? No, it's actually a biological mm -hmm. phenomenon mm -hmm. in terms of how long it takes for that so-called process to take place within a cell and for it to be educated in order to do uh, that particular uh, um, response. And also probably to, um, we say, replicate, to have another cell that's just like it that has the exact same mm. uh, memory. So there's science behind that. Glad to hear that. Dr. Henricks, how much time do you spend in a lab studying vaccines and studying the virus itself? Well, so uh, my per I don't personally get to be in the lab as much as I used to be, but in fact, uh, right now, it's a, it's a daily event, uh, meaning there is a challenge or there's a problem related to the vaccine or to the, uh, to the diagnostics, uh, and now the issue of whether or not there's a better test uh, to be used to evaluate the vaccine, those are things we work on on a daily basis. Wow. You know, how has our understanding of this virus and even its transmission changed from where we were, say, six months ago? Well, I think the most important thing people need to realize is that it's not just been six months. It's been 60 years uh, that we've been building our ability to deal with viruses. And in that re uh, um, aspect, we're very fortunate that the countries made the investment. We have some of the best scientists in the world working on it. 
uh, some of the best companies. A lot has gone into putting us to where we are today. And our educational institutions are just one example of, of where we are today because of the investment the country has made. You know, if you think about it, Christina, we have the genetic profile of this virus in literally within days of when the first cases were confirmed. Now, you think about that because many of these vaccines, not all of them, but many of these vaccines depend upon knowing the exact genetic profile of the virus. Similarly, uh, you look at these monoclonal antibodies that have been developed and, you know, the one that's been uh, certified by Eli Lilly and the Regeneron product uh, that President Trump received and hopefully will be widely available soon. Uh, you know, 20 years ago, I mean, that was would have been a dream to turn that around in months, let alone even have the technology to run the genetic profiles. You know, when you think about it, uh, when the very first genetic mapping was done, when the human genome uh, was first mapped. I mean, it, it, it took years and millions and millions of dollars, and now you can do it in an afternoon. I mean, it's a, it's a radical change of technology that has given us a lot of tools in the tool chest to deal with this pandemic. But even, you know, as a doctor, seeing this process moving so fast, warp speed, does that give you any concern, any pause about potentially working out the kinks? Are you comfortable with the speed in which these vaccines are rolling out? Well, there's something uh, about that that is actually um, a, a natural phenomenon that we've actually seen. So in the past, when you develop a vaccine, you need to accumulate the number of cases uh, in the normal population who have the disease in order to do the math and determine whether it works. But uh, maybe to our advantage, uh, to some degree, we have so much disease in the country, we were able to recruit enough individuals and do the math and do the proof that it worked that that would have never been possible in another situation or with any other disease. What do you foresee happening in the future within the medical community now that we've seen that this is possible? Do you think we're going to start to see vaccines and even drugs get approved faster? You know, I do. I think we're going to see drugs uh, approved faster because a lot of the acceleration of this was not the science part of it. The acceleration was removing the regulatory and the bureaucratic approval steps. You know, you think about it, there's phase one, there's phase two, there's phase three testing that has to be done. <clears throat> Typically, those processes would be separated by months, if not years, for new medication and new vaccines. <clears throat> and now we're doing phase two and phase three together. Uh, we're going to turn that around from a regulatory perspective in days, if not hours, uh, and not in terms of months and years. And hopefully, we'll be able to deal with uh, an, a really accelerated way of dealing with many new drugs and many new uh, vaccines uh, when they're needed and get things uh, out of the laboratory, what we like to call bench to bedside, get them out of the lab and get them into the bedside uh, safely and quickly. If I could add to that, um, the advantage of this RNA is huge. And so most people know about uh, the influenza vaccine that gets made in eggs every year. But uh, researchers now are already beginning to look at whether RNA approach will be useful for the other vaccines that we have. So it could absolutely revolutionize uh, vaccines uh, for our uh, use in the next couple of years. Wow. And by the way, make them more precise. That is so exciting. That is really exciting. It's unfortunate that it had to happen this way, but to see the advancements, the possibility, it really is exciting, I'm sure, for you being in the medical field. Okay, next up, Olga. Thanks for joining the conversation. Go right ahead. Yes, um, I would like to know, as medical workers on the front line, do we have a choice to whether we have to take the vaccine or will we be forced to take it? Well, Olga, I think a lot is going to depend <clears throat> upon uh, whether you work in a healthcare organization, are a frontline worker in a meat processing facility, uh, are working in a large school. As you know, uh, our school districts across the country do require vaccines for public school attendance. Uh, and as many uh, different companies, uh, for instance, most healthcare organizations, require that you either are immune or have been immunized. So, for instance, my organization 
uh, says that I need to get a flu shot every year unless I have some flu allergies or have had a bad allergic reaction. So my guess, Olga, is there'll always be an opt-out provision for people for medical reasons, but that the wisest uh, advice is going to be when the safe and effective vaccines become available, uh, that you should uh, take that opportunity. I don't know, Dr. Hendricks, what do you think in terms of uh, the whether we're going to see requirements for these vaccines or not? I think that's a very interesting question, but I don't yet know how the various institutions are going to come down on that question. A lot depends on the data that we've not yet seen. So it's really going to require us to see the data that is being presented to the FDA. And once we see that data, I think we'll be able to come up with an answer. I do think there are going to be more people lining up on day one than we're going to have capacity to uh, immunize. And then we'll get into what happens to those that are late adopters and skeptics and the so-called anti-vaxxers, uh, et cetera. And then at some point, the schools are going to have to weigh in on this as to what safety factors they want in order for teachers and other students, particularly, you know, we, we've said a lot, Christina, that children uh, are relatively safer uh, than the older adults, and that is absolutely true. But what we don't know is how many children are sitting next to another child in your class who has an immunodeficiency disease, who's being treated for cancer, has been hospitalized for inflammatory bowel disease or some other juvenile rheumatoid arthritis syndrome. And, uh, you know, we don't know that about all the kids in our classes. And so that's what it's going to come down to in the long run. Okay. You know, what I really love about this show and getting a chance to work with experts like the two of you is that we have been, I feel like, ahead of the eight ball so many times. And I just want to make sure everybody's prepared because they are thinking about vaccines right now. So what should people who do receive the vaccines expect? What if they get the vaccine, they get both doses, and all of a sudden they get sick? or they have to adjust their activities between the time of the first shot and the second shot. What do we really need to consider here so that nobody's surprised? Well, you know, so there's a lot of thinking about immunization and the timing and the sequencing of it. And while we don't know the date uh, that the vaccine's gonna come out, the long and the short of it is we do know that there are some what we would call mild reactions to all of these types of vaccines. Some people will have none. Like this year, I had no reaction to my flu vaccine. You could have kidded me, told me it was a fake, a zero. I hope it's not, but let's uh, be optimistic <laughs> about it. Uh, but uh, others will have low-grade fever. Others may have some uh, muscle aches, uh, particularly with the second dose of the vaccine when your body has a more robust immune reaction uh, to the vaccine. And so by that, uh, we need to be careful that, you know, maybe you don't want your whole family immunized on the same day so, because it, it's going to masquerade like early COVID. I'm going to guess that there are going to be individuals that are going to be tested uh, as a result of that just to be sure that they don't have COVID because, you know, fever, chills, muscle aches, et cetera, looks and sounds a lot like early COVID. Uh, you know, what we're working on in our healthcare organizations is, you know, we don't want all of our nurses vaccinated in a very short period of time. We'd like to space that out over a number of weeks uh, so that we don't run into a number of individuals calling in, having to be tested, uh, or for some reason, losing some of our frontline healthcare professionals. Yeah, that's, we do not want that at all. It's been so hard on them so far this year already. As we go into the next few months, and we're all hoping, you know, to see a change, to see the numbers starting to drop off, how long do you think it'll be, though, Dr. Gold, realistically, before we return to sporting events like we once did, or restaurants or malls, for that, for that matter, when rural Americans can go back to a shopping mall and shop comfortably? When do you think that's going to happen? So there are a couple of ifs here, Christina, and of course I'm going to ask Dr. Hendricks to weigh in on this also. But if the vaccines that are currently in the Warp Speed project, uh, well, let's say all six of them or even half of them, are mass produced, they're deemed to be safe and effective based upon the clinical trials that we've all been reading about, and that they start to be shipped uh, before Santa comes down the chimney, which we've been saying for a really long time, if, 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 and if Americans have the confidence and the wherewithal 
uh, to get access to these vaccines and they get the dual, the two doses that are necessary. I would say sometime late spring, early summer, we're going to start to see more normalcy across our country because we're going to have to immunize, nationally speaking, well over 200 million Americans. So that's 400 million doses of vaccines. And let's face it, not everybody's going to show up on day one. Obviously, if we can get our healthcare professionals immunized, uh, you know, that'll be a big step forward. So what I've been telling people, if we can get back into school in a near normal fashion next fall, meaning late August, uh, early September, uh, I would declare victory. But maybe uh, Dr. Hendricks has other thoughts in terms of the timing. Are you more optimistic than I am, Steve? No, I think it's going to be about that time period. But there is one other thing I'd like to add and respond to one of your other previous callers in this regard is how can we best prepare? And what I heard was somebody say he was two hours away from a physician or another individual said he hadn't seen a physician in a long, long time. I would actually encourage them to make the contact now uh, to find a physician. And if you can't because you're out in the Sand Hills or in the Badlands of North or South Dakota, then I also would consider or have you call one of the academic facilities that has a telehealth uh, program mm -hmm. because telehealth could be the other approach that you would have and that they could help you work through those any complications or the issues that you might have the questions you might have in between the vaccines I definitely would encourage that as well Excellent. great suggestion yeah and you know as we go into December we kick off the brand new month tomorrow and we we have heard from a number of medical professionals including you Dr. Gold that it could be a very tough month to get through as far as case numbers going up. What advice do you have for us as we get so close to a vaccine approval? What advice do you have for us as we move into December, hopefully the final final dark month? You know as I uh, like to say uh Hope for the best, plan for the worst. Uh, and of course, that hope is not a plan. Uh, so uh, anticipating that transmission rates are going to go up, hospitalization rates are going to go up, fatality rates are going to go up. Uh, this is a time to make sure you've got plenty of masks, you're well stocked with food and supplies in rural America, that you maintain all of this physical distancing, that you don't travel, uh, and that you really abide by all of these non-pharmacologic interventions until we can get through to availability of the vaccines. It's going to be particularly important as the weather gets colder. It's not going to be so easy to go outdoors. We're hitting the peak of flu season. And don't forget there are a lot of people that did not get flu vaccine this year as they don't every year. We have a lot of people in long-term care facilities, nursing homes, uh, correctional facilities, meatpacking facilities and others that are at high risk. So this is a time to redouble our efforts. We see the light at the end of the tunnel. We just have to get there safely and to minimize the number of deaths and hospitalizations as we travel that last mile of the journey. Absolutely. And Dr. Henricks, do you have anything to add to that? I would just add that um, uh, everybody knows there's been uh, COVID weariness and we're getting tired of this whole thing. But now that there, there is real reason for hope, uh, don't be the last person in your neighborhood to get infected. Let's, let's abide by the regulations and the recommendations that are being made. All right. Brilliant doctor with a beautiful singing voice. Thank you so much, both of you, for joining us. We really appreciate you, Dr. Gold, as always. Remember, if you didn't get your call in tonight, you can leave us a message, 855-776-6147. Wishing you a beautifully blessed evening.